so so content overload uh how would you well yeah how would you define content how would you define overload let's start there as you suggested okay asking for a strict definition that's a that's a, a tall order and i'm, I'm not, I'm not going to do that but i will i will say something about both um but on the heavy lifting front i mean like i said yesterday um we'll both be lifting heavy stuff um together but actually particularly because you're a marketeer and marketeers are um, you know, significantly responsible for this problem um, in a slightly different domain. But I think there's just so much that um, L&D can learn from, has learned from and you know, should learn from or, or reject actually marketing. So I think that's one of the specific in respects in which Sam Franklin is going to be contributing to this, this webinar. Um, Are you saying right, that we're contributing to content overload with this webinar, Mark? Um, we're we're contributing to content for sure um, but we'll get into quality and relevance later um that might get us off the hook uh we'll, we'll see okay so um what is content um i mean i i personally take and, and we as a company take and increasingly i think this is the the mood music as um as some people say um take a, a an all-encompassing or a broad view of of what content is so i mean obviously it's you know face-to-face -face classes it's courses it's articles it's videos um and then if you sort of okay that's that's a given um but if you expand a little bit beyond you know that to um other formats like infographics like podcasts like like lectures um then you can even push the envelope even more um to film to music um, I mean, really, it's just any any um, any piece of media that can change someone's brain in a way that's going to be potentially helpful to them, uh, make them more productive, make them feel more comfortable, um, sure of themselves at work. Um, and obviously, that can be digital, that can be non-digital. Um, I mean, some of the examples I've given are you know, clearly one or, or the other, um, but I don't think there's any sort of you know, something that it can educate can be can be either. Um, and the other thing to say about, about it and that gives a, an indication of, you know, how broad we think about it is where these things sit. So, you know, obviously learning management systems, obviously learning experience platforms, um, but also intranets, extranets, um, you know, SharePoint, um, could be Dropbox, um, even at large companies which have, you know, huge sort of centralized function, there'll be pockets of sort of rogue activity that um that goes on so you know it's just they, they it sits everywhere and then of course there's the internet um and that brings with it plenty of content so um yeah taking a broad view of content um means that one we have the biggest content overload problem we can possibly imagine but we also have a much better um chance of if we can cut through some of that of getting to you know really high quality um really relevant really inspiring um content which you know obviously not all corporate learning material is so yeah i take just a really broad view in order that we can do the um have the most effect with um you know filtering down content and getting to the the really good stuff um an overload yeah so this is um, i was giving my own uh, prompting my own my own question there so what do we mean by that i think it's i was thinking about that this morning because yesterday's answer was obviously really entirely happy um with it so you guys are getting a, a better a better better content um here i think it's it's um it's where you have so much stuff that it becomes unproductive so to put it position it crudely and simply obviously having 10 items on your corporate system is not going to be optimal and it's almost certainly not optimal to have a million or certainly a billion right is not going to be optimal so it's some sort of number in between and of course this will vary you know um day-to-day -day, um situation to situation I'm, I'm, I'm putting it deliberately crudely and simply so that we can just talk about something but if there is something like an optimal number or optimal range of numbers for the um the amount of content that you have then if you've got more than that it's suboptimal and you've got overload by by definition um so and then you know once you've got overload you've got the various problems that are associated with that you know content that's poor obsolete people don't discover it they miss out on the good stuff it lacks purpose um you know it means that people end up you know human beings curators l d professionals end up doing work that is frankly beneath them because it's just very repetitive you know in tagging content for example um and you also you know you, you waste you waste money 
so a lot of characteristics that come with um, this, this this issue of, of overload. Um, so I think it's a, a good topic that you've thought up, Sam. Well, you, you mentioned a billion, billion items, but there are some cheap uh, content library providers that are almost offering that these days. And we know of people that we've spoken to that there are people whose sole job is content curation and they're, they're quite specialized roles. They're getting paid quite a lot. So this is a problem that's generating extra spend and, and not just that, like further down for the end user, as you say, it's, it's making it hard to find the good stuff, essentially. Um, so Billy, who's actually on, on the chat, um, he wrote an article for us about it recently and he found this great stat um, that had been researched where essentially uh, content billion is costing the US economy 900 million, it's estimated, sorry, billion, billion, yeah, that million billion thing again, uh, a year, which is, is an insane amount. Um, but so if that's true, you know, take it with a pinch of salt, but we know it's costing a lot either way, then this is, this is a massive problem. And it's only set to be worse as everybody's digitizing their face-to-face -face training. There's just so much new content being chucked at everyone in a well-meaning manner. You know, we wanted to give everyone as much as we could to support them in difficult times, but uh, actually it turns out that too much can, can have the opposite effect. Um, how big a problem do you think it is, Mark, for the, for the industry as a whole? I think it's a nine hundred billion dollar um, uh, sort of problem. Um, I mean, I guess that that stat that Billy um, picked out was that was just the states, was it? And that's that's obviously not just talking about learning, right? It's talking about you know any sort of content and the the proliferation of content generally affects the U.S. economy by that sort of number. Yeah, yeah. is that right? Okay. Um, but I think in 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 L and I mean, it's probably just you know reasonably representative um, you know subset of of that. Of that issue, I mean, you, okay. So, where do you have wasted money? You you have wasted um, money because there is spend on content that is just not, you know, fit for purpose um, for the purposes of your, you know, of your organization at the moment. Um, then, and that, but that's significant. I mean, you know, in our, in our experience, that that runs into hundreds of thousands of dollars, pounds, euros, very, very quickly because you know the libraries are, are expensive. Um, and that's the, you know, that's sort of direct spend that you can you know, point to a line on a PNL or, you know, a, a line in a budget. Um, but then there's the much harder to calculate cost of just people not finding the stuff that is, you know, that is really useful. And, and I think this is, I mean, this is the thing that I, you know, personally feel is, you know, especially problematic and, and just such a shame because, Although there is just so much content out there, and I don't think that you know most of it is great. In fact, I think the opposite. I, th I think I think most of it is not great. Um, there is so much that really is, you know, in the right context, in inspiring and you know really rich, and actually can change um, someone's level of confidence. You know, just there and there and then. Um, it occurred to me this morning when I was thinking about the value that content can um, have on a person's life. Um, something I think I shared in in our Slack channel which was, it was just a, it was just a, a graphic with some words on it. And, and the words were basically saying that, look, if you've got a problem to solve, load your brain with the relevant information, then go for a walk. Um, now that's something I actually do myself um, anyway, but seeing it you know, written like that, having that sort of, you know, it resonates with how someone else's brain uh, works when they're, when they're trying to tackle a, um, a problem that they find complex was, you know, that was really sort of reassuring. It encouraged me to do, to do more of that. So, um, so yeah, I mean, how are you going to calculate all of that, that opportunity cost of all of the content um, that would have, you know, if it's seen the light of day and impacted someone's life um, and changed their behavior, um, what impact would that have, you know, downstream on the economy? Well, some economists have, uh, you know, for that study got, got to a number, but I guess that's how they do it. It's, it's both um, sort of, you know, miss um, poor spend and avoiding that. Um, but also something to do with uplift in, in productivity. Um, I mean, it's, look, it's, it, yeah. And another respect, um, another sort of perspective, which indicates that it's a massive problem is that, you know, most of the clients that we um, talk to have um, issues with, with, with content, you know, it, it feeling dull to a lot of users or um, a lot of it being obsolete. That was a question that came up yesterday. I wonder if um, the people on this uh, webinar, you know, find that, um, or it's just, you know, really, dry um you know a lot of those libraries are are like that there are some exceptions but it's you know it's quite hard to it's quite hard to teach that material in a way that is you know both generic so it's it's not 
it's not personalized um, at that point, at the point of, um, you know, its creation um, and, and you know, make it really impactful. It's a, it's a tough, it's a, it's a tough ask. And I don't think that they, the providers can or do, you know, usually um, strike that balance. So it's, you know, it's tough. It's a big problem. Big, basically, is my answer to your question. Huge problem. Perfect. But yeah, you're absolutely right. I think from what people have spoken to, it does seem like that. And even if a library is good for, for one part of your skills framework or initiative that you're trying to work on, it may may not be for another, which we'll touch on later. Well, another thing with that, Sam, is like the, if you think about why this is a problem for people, it's not like people in L&D um, just got some budget and then went and bought loads of things and too many things and then suddenly they've got a problem it's you know it's much more complex and involved and you know, and it's a situation that's emerged over a number of years so I and mean, for a start they've normally in inherited all sorts of you know bits and pieces anyway you know including libraries um but you know the proprietary content that they've um that just sort of exists there um and then um, and then, you know, they'll have to make some sort of sense of the web. And in that, there'll be so many duplicates. And, I, and what I mean by that is exact duplicates where the file is more or less, you know, two files are almost more or less identical, but there's something in the title or um, metadata that sort of distinguishes them. So, you know, do you take that, the, the brave, do you feel empowered to take the brave step to, you know, get rid of um, one? But apart from sort of exact duplicates, you just got repetitive content. So, you know, courses, articles, um, videos on project management, for example, or time management, um, there's so much overlap between the content and how do you, you know, uh, differentiate in a way that is meaningful and, you know, scalable and, you know, and good. So, um, you know, you can see why these things have, have, have um, why these issues have come about. And, and we don't get great data either on, on any of these. So, you know, from different providers, um, sometimes the, you know, content providers, I mean, uh, but sometimes the platform providers don't, don't play ball with giving data in the right in the right form and you know in a timely manner so you can see why it happens yeah absolutely and i think like your walk this morning where you loaded up your mind beforehand it's about getting those magic moments um and distinguishing like you said from all those different time management bits of content which is actually good um i'm interested in, in asking the chat actually um, we ran this poll yesterday. There were some really interesting results. Um, so the question for it is, what percentage of your the content in your learning ecosystem is truly useful? Obviously, you're not going to know exactly, but um, yeah, provide an estimate. We've given some rough ranges. There's quite a few filtered people here as well. So maybe estimate filtered people what you think industry-wide or do it for filtered, but obviously it's going to be 100% right mark. Um, so I'm going to put the poll live now. So you should be able to see see a poll and vote on uh, what percentage of the content in your learning ecosystem is truly useful. Okay, some interesting results coming in. But mostly towards the lower end of the spectrum. So most people don't think that all that much is useful. The thing is, even if it's zero to 20% is useful, um, okay, but which uh, zero to 20%? That's, you know, it's a key question, like whatever the percentage is. And, um, and of course you can dig into, you know, how, how um, valid is a gut, you know, gut feeling about percentage of useful content? What do you mean by useful? Um, you know, all sorts of things. Um, but regardless, there's, there's probably going to be, you know, you could investigate um, ways to draw a line somewhere and um you know how where do you draw that line um and and what do you do then with the the rest of that of that content so no one said 80 to 100 percent interesting okay i'm going to share the results now um oh, we saw them first did we yeah we had a sneak preview so there are the results everybody quite interesting that 20 to 40 percent was the, the majority no one brave enough to say that 80 percent and above their content was actually useful and we saw similar results yesterday as well in the poll that we ran there. So, you know, it may, it may not seem that crazy, but you're saying there that the majority of the content in your learning ecosystem is not useful. And as you said, Mark, like how do you work out which half is the good half? It's, it's really difficult. So you can see with the scale of content overload and the, the issues with quality here, 
how hard it is to, to break that down. Um, yeah, so thanks guys for your, for your input on that one. That's really useful. Um, and yeah, just moving on to the next slide. So if we're gonna have a, a big crack at this problem, we need to, to break it down into smaller parts. So Mark, we've quite helpfully done that here. And um, do you wanna take us through starting with abundance? Um, how you think this kind of way of thinking about content can help us start to solve the problem of overload? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, abundance and, and overload are, you know, in the English language, reasonably similar um, concepts, terms. Um, so, I mean, about abundance, I would, I would say, you know, echo what, what I said before, you know, if you, if you, even if you don't take a broad view of um, what constitutes um, content or learning content, um, there's just loads with, you know, with, with courses and classes and, and articles. Um, but certainly if you take a broader view that you've just got so, so much and you take a very broad view, you, you, you do run into billions. Um, you can actually have a, you actually run into billions, you know, relatively um, uh, quickly because of the web. There were 2 billion blogs and articles published just this year in 2020. Um, and, and then it was all the stuff that was produced before that as well. So obviously most blogs and articles are not relevant to your industry, your company, but there'll be a, you know, 0.1% of it that is, or at least should be considered. And so you just got, you know, huge, huge numbers um, just straight away. Um, so that's on abundance. Um, and then how we start to, to tackle that huge morass of, of content is, um, well, with these next three three bullets, as you've got them on the slide, so think about quality, think about relevance, think about data. Um, so just to say something on, on each of those, on quality, first of all. So what I'm talking about here is raw quality. So not the relevance of content for your particular purpose, which we'll obviously come on to next, but something like raw quality or usefulness of that, of that content. Um, and there's a number of clues that you can take to to give you some sort of approximation there so one would be you know usage popularity that's a that's an easy one to pick because there's there tends to be data um on it um but there isn't always data on it i mean if it's new if it's new content then you've got no you know popularity data so i mean it's an imperfect measure in in loads of respects um but i'd encourage people to think about um a nuance of that data so you might take a ratio for example um so like completes per open as a maybe that's a better measure than just pure um pure opens um then there's impact um so this of course this is it's hard to you know directly measure i mean this is you know one of the holy grails of um you know of l and d how do you me measure the impact of of learning but um there's some things that you can do i mean we ask for um users as part of the magpie interface to tell us if content in order to, to market is complete to tell us if it was useful um or whether you know it just wasn't relevant to what they're doing or they they already knew it um in asking that question we collect data on usefulness um you know per asset which uh which we can then you know use for making recommendations down the line um and talking of down the line another thing that we could do on and we would, I would encourage anyone to do um, with respect to quality is, is try and get some sense of downstream application of that content in your particular um, uh, field in your, in, your, in your business. So that is not just did the person who's done that piece of, you know, reading or watch that video market as useful immediately after seeing it, but, you know, a month later, have they been able to apply it in their jobs? Um, have they been able to contribute to some business outcome as a result um, of, you know, of reading that thing or watching that thing? Um, there's other measures as well, um, and these are harder to get to, but they are, you know, they're really important, like the breadth of content, you know, how, um, what does it cover? What's its coverage? The depth of the content as well, um, its originality. Um, also, important is the representativeness of that content so you know is it sourced are the providers of that content are the teachers the thinkers from a broad um and representative uh, cross-section of society um or not so there's quite a lot that goes into quality but um i should also say something about relevance so this is the you know this is context if you've understood what the the big 
the high priority of big ticket items are at the at the company, you know, your company. Um, so you know, really understanding what the problem is that LND is being being asked to to try and solve or have a go at, mm -hmm. and you know, and beneath that, what are the the skills and capabilities that are relevant, and how exactly what exactly is meant by like, data literacy, for example, or resilience. Um, because you know these are words, and there's some sort of common understanding of what these words mean, but um, there's there's nuance. So, what exactly are those um, skills? Then you can set algorithms, um, you know, with the help of human expertise, uh, to run through that content and and give you some some data, which I'll come on to in a second. Um, actually, both for quality and relevance, but particularly for for relevance, where it's very very difficult to do. And if you've got that data, um, well, then you can rank that content. And you can say, well, you know, above this line, I'm going to have that content in beneath it. Um, I'm not. You can also, I mean, before you do that, actually, you would validate it. You would, you know, how as um, how does a human compare? And and that's actually where you know the, the exciting work that we've we've been doing this year you know, really comes in because we think that for this particular use case of um, applying algorithms to learning content, you know, given title description and, and sometimes body text, we can classify just as well as and obviously much faster than um, human beings. So, so getting the data for relevance and quality is you know, a big part of being able to cut into that um, abundance overload. Um, I mean, on, on data, well, I mean, one, just the problem. It, it's a problem because, I mean, even if you just take two well-tagged libraries like, um, you know, uh, I'll call them out because they're well, they're just actually really good libraries. Um, so Harvard Business Review has 20 something thousand um, articles on it. Coursera probably has, I don't know, several thousand um, uh, courses. These are really good providers, um, but they won't be describing their content in um, the way that you want to describe uh, content or the skills that you're trying to um, to lift in your company. They also almost certainly aren't going to talk about um, content in the same way as uh, as each other. And then you throw in a num number of other providers and, and the web. Um, you can see why this is this is difficult. And then you might want to take into account other um, sources of data, like you know search data on on uh, on SharePoint or search data on an LMS or an LXP. So there's you know just a lot of different data sources. How do you make how do you make sense of that? Um, well, one of the ways of making um, sense of that is, you know, taking that all into account and building a skills framework, which um, is, you know, based on that. And so there's some some pull for, you know, some of those terms, and like for example, with with search data, um, and then have the algorithms produce the content, the the tags, in exactly the way that you need them. So it doesn't matter what what the source is, where it's come from. Um, the output is one of 25, 30, 50, whatever it is, um, skills and the skills framework that you know, you've know you arrived at and which you know um, will help with the you know, capabilities that you're trying to lift and the problems that your business is trying to, is trying to solve. So, you know, AI is not, um, AI is cool, obviously, and you know, everyone wants to have an AI story, um, but that AI story is a lot better if it's, um, if it's tangible and real and, and having, um, and having content that's been specifically classified by um, a set of algorithms, you know, with human with human input that you can put up, you know, side by side against, um, you know, humans doing exactly the same thing. That's a that's a very good and interesting AI um, uh, story. Yeah, and we did a similar experiment, didn't we, Mark, for um, Scientific American, where you you took on the AI and. Uh... Well, I won't say that the AI won, but it performed well in, in certain respects, didn't it? Yeah, the title of that is I took on it's something like I took on AI and won and lost. So the winning was or the losing was um the AI performing as well as, you know, because that was actually my own um tagging of, of content. But the winning was because, you know, we'd we'd produced it as a as a as a company. So yeah, that's in Scientific American and yeah, let, let's share that link with um uh, with people. Actually, can I just say something else about data? Because um, one thing that annoys me about um, webinars is when people just talk at too high, high a level. It's, it's really easy to do that. So I just want to sort of bring it down a couple of levels and, and just be really, really tangible with a couple of things. So um, 
like I did yesterday, I'm going to um, pick out some some learning content at random from the web. And this happens to be an article that I wrote on, on Harvard Business Review called um, How Time Boxing Works and Why It Will Make You More Productive. Now, this comes from a really good library, right, Harvard, um, you know, for certain, for certain audiences, a really good um a really good, really good library. And it comes with some metadata already. So, um, you know, one of the tags that it comes with is time management. Um, it's got a tag, a tag line as well. So which is in this case, when you commit to doing something, decide when you'll get it done. Okay, it's a decent um, uh, tag. But even with this, and this is pretty much like the best scenario where you've got a you know, high quality um, library, which is very well tagged. If you're a particular company, there's at least three issues with, with even that. So the most obvious is that it's not necessarily tagged to your skills framework. So maybe, maybe it is, maybe you've got time management in your skills framework in which, you're, in which case you're, you're absolutely fine. Um, but actually even then, do you mean by time management what they mean by time management? Not necessarily, there's, you know, there's nuance there. Would you necessarily wanna have, um, uh, uh, time boxing um, in that so um so i think there's an issue with with that for a start and then another issue is to do with um search so even if you're tagging this asset and you put it into your your lms and maybe your lxp um as well and so it's tagged with time management um so that's fine for the users that are going to type in time management and then because it's tagged it will it will show up um, but what about the users that use different search queries, but are, you know, have the same sort of intent? Um, if you don't have a sort of a broader set of synonyms or some kind of system to catch that, then some of your users are going are gonna to miss out and, you know, you're reducing your search um, success. Um, and, and yeah, and the other thing is sort of missing nuance from a piece like this. So having written the article, I know obviously what it's about, right? And it is, yeah, sure, it's about time boxing. It is about time management, but it's also, it's so much more than that. Um, it's also about agency and control and autonomy um, as well. And so for someone that is interested in taking more control of their, um, of what they're doing, you know, in their jobs and that feeling that experiential, that feeling of control. This might be a useful article. I'm not saying it's the, it's the best one, but it was certainly like the author intended for, for that to be an aspect of this. And if you just sort of lump it with that label that we got from Harvard, time management, okay, it's fine, but it misses out on, I mean, like I say, quite a lot of the nuance. So, and that's the best case scenario. I mean, the worst case scenario is just so much worse than that. There's no tags at all, or the tags are, are bad, or um, there's no, you know, there's no, there's no tagline. Um, so even in the best case um, scenario, there's there's definitely some work that um, algorithms can help us with. Yeah, I mean, that's just, that's one example, right? And when you take the numbers of, of scale that we're talking here with content overload, it's, it can get pretty crazy. Viv's put a really good example in the chat um, about how Utopia is to have one bit of useful content at a time and in a context that's useful to a person. And that's what we're kind of going towards with this. But he's got a great example with the numbers as well. So, um, if he only needs one piece of content per day per workday, then the library cannot be smaller than 250 items per year. And if people's needs diverge by 50% and he works in a 10,000 people organization, then the library needs to be over a million items. So he's illustrated there the problem of content overload really well. So the, what we need to work out here, Mark, is how we can take that tagging approach and what you've, you've started to talk about here with the algorithms and how can we apply it at, at that kind of scale. Yes, that's sort of a question. Um, uh, I just wanted to respond actually to, to Viv's, Viv's point about the numbers though, because um, I think that's that's another way of making a webinar more interesting when you just sort of um, pin things down, even if it's just sort of for the for the sake of, um, well, for the sake of argument, but just you know, making it really, really tangible. That's what I was doing actually before with the 10 and, and a million or, or, or a billion. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot to be said for, um, well, as you know, I think it's on the home page, our homepage at the moment. You know, less is um, less is more, um, and you can see it though with certain providers out there. I'm um, not all of them. So, like with YouTube, um, because it's user generated content. So, by definition, it's going to just like have all of this different stuff. And there's, I think, there's like, I mean, it's definitely many billions of, um, of videos on there. I think it's it's probably over ten billion. Anyway, it's just loads. Um, 
but that's user generated content. And and so the, the same would be true for you know any of the social media sites, right? In terms of like the amount of content, that's um is huge. But Netflix is not user generated content. Um, neither is Spotify. But I want to use the example of of Netflix because it tells the this story and kind of what um Viv's are, are getting at, I think. Um, in that. Uh, Netflix used they they started off having something like ten thousand um, items in there. I'm probably more than that. I, mean, I think it was maybe fifteen thousand. And obviously, with Netflix, with the pool that they have, everyone's banging on their um, doors saying, you know, uh, let let me in. Um, so, but they but they've been actually reducing the number of um, titles in the library because you know as they got more and more data and they've worked out that actually it's not more effective to have a very 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 long tail. It's more effective to just have the right stuff. Um, I think much more of that kind of approach with um, with you know corporate systems is is part of the future and and what we're trying to uh, deliver with the, you know this algorithmic approach, which is um, what this slide is leading leading us to. So um, so what's the question here? So should I try and answer that question specifically? What, how can we judge content quality? Um, at scale. Um, okay, so I think there's two sides to this, which I touched on earlier. So, you know, quality and, and relevance. Um, on on quality, I mean, I went through, you know, a bunch of those, uh, the, the, the potential, um, the inputs that you can take to make a, make a call on quality. So, you know, usefulness, impact, provider reputation, breadth, depth, um, originality, societal factors, you know, re representativeness, um, some sort of u nuance on usage. Um, but then on relevance, um, and this is where the most of the effort that we put into um, this this year on, you know, our algorithmically working out whether um, a particular asset is about, or how much it is about, say, curiosity or resilience or creativity or, or some slightly narrower um, uh, label. And um, and if you if you've got if you can develop a set of algorithms that produce that sort of output and you put them side by side like i was saying before you know so you can say look for for curiosity given the pool of content that you have so it's these i don't know ten thousand um, items and given you know you've said that curiosity curiosity is on a lot of people's minds at the moment um or resilience or whatever it is uh, mindfulness um for this particular topic skill we've the algorithms are saying look it's these 50 items or these 150 items or, or whatever and the great thing about that is um i mean one you can just use it in loads of different ways i mean what that could be used for a campaign that could be used to create pathways that could be used to just decide what goes in or not into um your uh, your system um but it can also be used to just judge the ai against um human performance because at that sort of number 100 items or 20 items you can just say look i agree i agree agree don't agree don't agree and then and then decide actually you know who made the better judgment was it the ai or the or the, the person so that's also actually the sales bit of this um uh this webinar that i wanted to to get across that you know for anyone that, that's serious let me really serious about this um issue um and and have some sort of content overload uh, problem well, we're happy to run an, an analysis um so running our algorithms through some of your content um, for, for free, all you really need to do is, is tell us a couple of the libraries that you have or, or provide us with a sample of the data. Um, and, 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 and also like, you know, what's the high priority skill or two for, for you? And we'll run the algorithm, share the results and have a discussion, have a, you know, have a nice time. So um, it's actually not that salesy because I'm offering something for free. So um, it's, just, uh, it's just nice really. Yeah, and I highly recommend that, that anyone that does want to do that gets in touch with us, just uh, LinkedIn us, whatever. We're, we're pretty approachable. And actually, we do have an example of what that looks like uh, in action, right? This is the output from the, the content intelligence module of Filtered, right, Mark? Yeah, it's one of um, one of the outputs at the moment. So there's, yeah, there's there's um, two two forms. So one is just a, a, a an ordered list of um, content for um, a particular skill. You can see three um, sheets here. So one is um, curiosity, one is time management, one is influence. Uh, but on that top one for curiosity, for a sample set of data, I think it's about 20,000 assets we had in this um, particular uh, pool. Um, 
this is the content that is being brought up. That's the source. So you've got the URL, you've got the, uh, the confidence score. So, you know, when it says 99%, that means that we are 99% sure that that asset really is about, um, about curiosity. There's a quality score in there as well, usefulness um, score as well. So um, that's, yeah, exactly. That's, that's one of the forms of outputs and that's useful in multiple um, ways, as I was saying before, you know, you could use that for pathways, you could use that for a discussion, you could use that for, you know, just a, a content marketing um, and pushing out, you know, LND messages. Um, you can, but you can also use it when you aggregate it by um, provider, and this is the next slide. Um, uh, you can use it to help make buying decisions. So once you've worked out, okay, these are the priorities for, for me and my company um, over the next 18 months or whatever. So, you know, it's really about curiosity and difficult conversations and, you know, whatever else, you know, that, that makes it into this skills, skills framework. Um, you run these algorithms and they can just work out for you. Well, how many assets are relevant from each of these um, libraries that I'm paying a lot of money in some cases or not so much in others. And you can work out a, a quotient, a, a, a statistic that, that might be helpful. I mean, we've got one in here, which is the cost per qualifying asset. So you just take how much you're paying for that library, let's say it's a hundred thousand um, pounds. And you found, let's say to make things nice and easy, the math's nice and easy, a hundred relevant items, then you're paying a thousand pounds per asset. Um, now that's okay. What do you do with that? Well, a few things. I mean, interrogate it, um, throw, them, throw them out around, um, you know, discuss it with us. So you get comfortable that that is, um, you know, it's a meaningful uh, statistic. Um, but once you do, and we think you will, because we've done quite a bit of this work, then that's a point of negotiation um, for, or potential negotiation with a, with a provider, you know, or, or maybe there's nothing to negotiate because if there's really not, not that very much relevant content, then, um, then there's, you know, there's, there's not so much of a case for, for keeping it, but it may be that your content provision is perfect you know, currently, um, but the data will help bear that out. And it just brings um, data to the, um, to the, to the conversation. Um, data that's you know sorely lacking in in business in general, but you know certainly in, in L and D um, negotiations. So we're really happy to have plugged a gap here by you know combining the understanding of the client need with um, algorithmic um, uh, calculations. We're able to produce data that really you know helps with the specific um, and actually really important. Um, endeavor, which is to, you know, reskill the population. I saw a couple of days ago, CBI saying that 90% of the workforce will need to substantially reskill by 2030. Well, obviously with so much change going on in the world at the moment, you alluded to it at the start of this, um, um, you know, skills development, um, efficient skills development, enjoyable um, and efficient, effective, and the right sort of skills, skills development is more important than than ever. I mean, literally more important than ever. There's also a World Economic Forum uh, report that came out, I think, yesterday or, or yesterday that, that says the same thing. So, you know, that it's more important is um, clear and having data to, to make the right decisions is, is um, more useful than ever. So that's why we're very pleased with this direction that we're, we've taken filtered in. Yeah, absolutely. And, and making data driven decisions is something that L&D is always clamoring to be able to do. And this is the kind of thing that can help with that. There are other ways too, but um, I think it's a noble, noble goal to help with that reskilling that you mentioned. And I'm, I'm conscious of time. So uh, in just a few sentences, Mark, um, can you explain? So this, a lot of what we've talked about so far is kind of pre-platform, right? You're getting the content and making sure that you're putting the good stuff into the platform. Once it's in there, how, what would be your, your best advice in terms of making sure the good stuff reaches the top? Um, okay, so I'd say th three things. I mean, if you've, well, okay, so I'd say four things. Um, if you've if you've tagged it really well and understood, you know, relative to a problem that's really important, then first of all, and, and not put in everything, then already you're you're winning relative to to yesterday. Um, I mean, it's kind of again like you know what Viv was saying in the in the chat about um, or what we've been saying for you know long long time um less is more that's why we picked you know filtered as a as a name so i think that's that's already a, a big win but then there's just other obvious stuff which i've kind of alluded to so search on the 
Mark, we've uh, lost your sound. I can assure everyone that wasn't just me cutting Mark off. <laughs> the climactic Stay moment. Time. Oh, Mark, you're back. You're back. <laughs> oh, really? I, I, you lost me. Yeah, sorry. I was crediting Laurie Niles Hoffman for this. Um, you know, using search data to inform. Um, all sorts of learning learning strategy. But um, the point here is to do with, if it's better tagged, then you're much more likely to um, uh, get better search results um, and, and even more likely to, if you take into account organic um, search terms. So search improves. Um, that's part of how you, you, you surface uh, content from a sort of a, a pull point of view. But from a push point of view, um, two things. I mean, one is algorithmic recommendations. Um, and the more that your recommendation, uh, recommend a system takes into account a deep understanding of the content. And I mean, a lot of providers talk about AI powered uh, recommendations, but, um, but uh, you know, I wonder um, how deep into the content um, some of them have got. I mean, we, we know sort of what we do there, but anyway, the recommendations can be, they're obviously enabled and, and enhanced. And then the, the last point is, campaigns and so really like you know push push so rather than just sort of expecting people to, to be on the platform and search for stuff or you know receive recommendations and use the content that will obviously serve you know a decent proportion of um of the population uh push it to them so you know microsoft teams is is obviously you know one candidate there so is email as ever but you know run campaigns that are thematic that are data informed that are personalized uh, the more that you can do that um, the better, uh, or the better engagement you'll have. But if it's intelligent enough, it's not just going to be any old engagement of just you know someone spending some time doing something. It's it's high, it's much more likely to be high quality. So um, so yeah, what am I saying there? I guess I'm saying um, uh, the curation. So you know less search recommendations campaigns. That's how we surface the good stuff. Awesome, good summary, Mark. Uh, very succinct. And um, yeah, just on the last one in, in terms of campaigns, that's where that marketing that you talked about right at the start can be brought in, the techniques from marketing to reach people, get their attention and, and help guide them through. So um, yeah, great, that makes a ton of sense. And I just wanted to, to quickly ask at the end, um, are there any questions from, from anyone in the chat before we finish? Speak now or forever hold your peace. Cool. Okay. Um, well, also, awesome. or ask it elsewhere at a later date when a question um, occurs to you. Yeah, yeah. With the power of the internet, you're free to ask us any time. And as we said earlier, if, if you wanted to hear about any of the stuff we've talked about in this webinar in more detail, then do get in touch via LinkedIn or just visit our site. And there's loads more great content on there that Billy's been writing and other people in the team have been writing. So, so please do jump on and, and have a look around. Um, yeah. And on that note, um, I'll end this filtered forum thanks so much for your time mark that was excellent stuff thank you sam